Welcome to the most uh, interesting panel, three finance guys. What could be more exciting? <laughs> Um, look, uh, I think the title of the panel was is that there's a lot of changes in, in venture capital going on in Europe and, and, and around the world, but maybe especially in Europe, kind of catching up to what the U.S. has been doing for quite a while. And we'd like to talk about, you know, what does it mean to entrepreneurs and how can you navigate that? So I want to pick on Felix, not just because he has um, pretty awesome glasses, uh, it seems familiar, um, but also because, Felix, you, you are one of the most prolific uh, entrepreneurs in Berlin. Uh, you've been on the good side. You've recently joined the force, the dark side. Welcome. <laughs> and I'm sure you, being an entrepreneur, you've raised a lot of money from uh, some really good funds. And I'm sure you've had some good experience and some bad experience. So now that you're on the dark side, what are you going to do differently? Well, How are you going to not suck? <laughs> well... Um, I'm trying to, to do what I did before. Um, I mean, I was not only an entrepreneur, but I was also an angel. And I think, you know, the, what I felt what I could do as an angel was to um, help people um, avoid mistakes, be really close and, you know, really uh, work with them. And, um, and I feel as a VC, the, the firm I, I joined, Faber Ventures, um, we, we're doing the same thing. I mean, we're not... Um, the, the idea is not to, um, I think that, you know, what people don't like about VCs is, is that they don't understand that um, they're also, like an entrepreneur, they actually have a risk, right? I mean, there's this thing called carry, and I mean, this is how it should work. You, you land a hit, you do something really well, a company that you're working with, a company you find is doing really well, then you should make money. But the problem is, is that the incentive structure of a VC, and this is why sometimes they're being seen as fat, lazy bastards that just hang around at conferences, is, is because, um, it's because they, they, they make a comfortable living and they can just be a VC, you know? Um, that's what they do. Um, they don't need to take the same risks. But in fact, they do. So, um, I mean, what we are doing is, is, is really sort of uh, reinvesting all the money in having, you know, 10, 20 developers on the ground. I go in, I do design sprints with the companies um, if they want that, right? So, um, I think um, basically, I, I hope to do it by just sort of doing what I did before and, you know, building great companies and then just sort of getting, getting your hands really dirty. Um, and your VC should be, should be your, your unfair advantage and until now, People thought, okay, if I get a good VC, the unfair advantage I get is they open up the address book and, you know, they know how to make deals. But the unfair advantage that they had with their experience, they were using to, um, in negotiations with the company. So they were using their unfair advantage to, to get an advantage for them. Um, and I think, you know, if you have um, former entrepreneurs, for example, as VCs, the unfair advantage you should be getting is, is that you're getting a a SWAT team that you can use uh, if, if, if needed, right? Um, so that's hopefully what we're trying to do better. We're reinvesting all the money. We're not making uh, a lot of money. The salaries are extremely low. We're really betting on actually making it big and not on, you know, drawing a big salary. So in that sense, we're just operating like the companies, like we want our companies to operate. Okay, cool. The thing that's uh, happening in Europe, especially in, in the U.S., has been ahead is that <clears throat> you have a lot of old dinosaur venture firms from the late 90s, and venture firms, unfortunately, die very slowly because of 10-year fund cycles, so you can be very bad at it for a very long period of time and still be in business and, it, it, and become a very bad product for entrepreneurs. Now, not so Bessemer. <laughs> Bessemer has been around for ages um, and is still successful, so it kind of is a pretty rare animal that you can live for that long and still everybody be hungry. Like, how did, how did that work? How did you guys not start sucking? It's a good question, and we always ask ourselves, you know, how do we make sure that we don't suck in the future? And I think what Bessemer has been able to do that not a lot of other v large VCs that were able to do is kind of continuation of generations. So within Bessemer, there is no one guy. Most VC firms, they have like, you know, the one guy, many times the VC firm is called, on, you know, the name is the name of that guy, and then when he leaves, you know, the firm kind of dies or when there's strong people that are supposed to kind of move up the ladder, basically they know that there is no upward mobility, and they go and join other VC firms, kind of, or open their own stuff. At Bessemer, we have a management committee, so there's like six people that are, uh, that are the managing committee, and you can move into the managing committee based on your performance, and you can move out of the management committee based on uh, your, if you're not good enough. So you can basically just, you know, stay as a managing partner for a very long time because in the 80s you made like one good investment and, uh, and then that's it. And that's how we were able to kind of reinvent ourselves and completely, you know, and continue from generation to generation. 
Okay, great. Uh, so <clears throat> Felix was just talking about all the value that they're going to add and they have developers and this kind of stuff. And it's, it's, it's quite fashionable, but it also makes a lot of sense. Atomico also has a whole bunch of services and I work with you guys and I saw it happen. So I can vouch that it's legitimate and <laughs> not just fashionable. But um, there's HR, there's PR, there's business development, all this kind of stuff. Now, a lot of firms offer that now, especially the bigger ones. I is it even a differentiator? Does it really matter? Or is it just kind of a, a coat of paint that everybody has to have? Like, here's our PR guy. No, I disagree. I think it depends on how you implement it, of course. Um, talking about it is one thing, and executing is another, right? Um, at Atomico, we believe that entrepreneurs and good companies can come from anywhere. So we've built a platform where not only we have people in very strategic markets like Japan, China, the US, Latin America, and Europe to help them enter these different markets, but also we have functional expertise in recruiting, which is a big pain point for companies. How do they find talent? Competition for talent is, is really becoming a big differentiation. So how do you hire your next head of product or VP of engineering? or head of sales, um, how do you help put people in these different countries, this becomes a big strategic advantage. So we help companies do that. And also on the PR side or comms, how do you build your brand? This has big impact on how you help recruit people, gain customers. So we kind of build these different services across the firm to help um, the companies. Um, so I think also it depends on how, what is the, f the, the culture of the firm, right? Some funds have global brands, but they have local funds. So local funds find it hard to work together because they're incentivized with their local carry in a in region. And so it's difficult for them to really be focused on and work as a team because the incentives are not there. At Atomico, we have a global fund. So if you do an investment in Japan, the person in, uh, and that portfolio wants to go and expand in, in the US or in Latin America, the team in Brazil has an incentive to help the Japanese company get there, right? So I think that's also the structure of the fund plays a big role of how people are going to work together to help the entrepreneurs. Could I yes. interject here and uh, be a bit controversial on this topic? We at Bessemer, we offer everything. You know, we have internal recruiting, we have our PR team, uh, you know, everything that you'd probably want as an entrepreneur. But at least that's my bias. In the end of the day, it's all marketing. The majority of it, I think, you know, when you look at our best investments, and there's come some kind of a negative selection bias here. Our best investments, you know, historically, whether it's uh, LinkedIn, whether it's Pinterest, Yelp, uh, Wix, uh, and many others, I don't know, I know how better off they would have been with our recruiting uh, effort or with our PR or independently. Because the best companies and the best teams you invest in in the end of the day, we call it like basically donut board meetings. When you go to the board meetings, you eat a donut, and then, and, and then that's it. The ones that you really struggle with, that they're doing, you know, that they need more of your help, that's the guys that kind of use all your services. So we have these services, they, they help, but I think in the end of the day, VC firm really helps in credentialing. They help with their kind of the, their expertise, what they know, uh, having been there, doing it, seeing it before and with kind of the network that you mentioned before of having other good companies that you can talk to, learn best practices, maybe recruit from, and, and things like that. Uh, I think most of the other things that VC firms offer today, including us, is a bit of bullshit. So I can, I'll, di I'll disagree with that respectfully, but I think you're talking about big success stories in the US, right? So these are companies that had huge scale before they had to go international. So they had the size, they had the muscle, before they went international. I think now we're seeing a very different dynamic where you have companies that are, take a true caller, which was one of our portfolio companies, right? Started in Sweden. Now it's truly a global company, right? Adding 300,000 new subscribers a day, right? So how do you manage out of Sweden where you have a huge install base of new subscribers in countries you've never been, like India or China, right? It's not obvious for a Swedish guy to know how to enter China. Until you've been, unless you've been a serial global entrepreneur and you've done that three times before, you're not gonna know what it takes to enter China. So I think the companies you're talking about are very different, and I think the dynamic now is changing dramatically, and that's what's exciting, I think, both for entrepreneurs and for VCs, is that you have a chance, wherever you are, to start to now build a global company, right? And you don't need to be huge in the US before you can become successful. So I think the role of the VCs is changing, the way you need to support these companies is changing, and that is also has obviously impacts on, on the nature of the investors that will be successful, I think. 
Okay, <clears throat> no, I, I agree probably both are, are right. <laughs> um, so what's happening in, in Europe, and we talked about it, is that um, some LPs, so people that invest in funds, we call them LPs, limited partners, told me everybody and their mother is raising a new venture capital fund. And he said, there's, and it's always two guys with a deck. <laughs> and so two management consultants with a deck. So with all these new firms popping up, you know, um, what, is, what do you guys think is the genesis of a great next generation venture capital firm? And lots of entrepreneurs will be bombarded with all these new venture firms that don't have any logos on their webpage yet and just two guys. You know, what makes a great new venture capital firm and how can European entrepreneurs maybe quickly sort out between the uh, sort of uh, noise and signal ratio? Any thoughts? You're starting a new one, so you should know. <laughs> well, I think the... The, the, the simplest answer to that, the most simple answer to that is, is track record, right? I mean, we're raising our fund now, but we've already done 18 investments, right? So we already had investors. I mean, we, we did it sort of the, the rock way, just, you know, get investors into the company because, you know, raising a fund is a, it's a, it's a fairly formal animal you're creating there. And I think before you start doing that, you should actually, you know, have had some, some, some relevant, um, um, relevant investments um, and, and a little bit of a track record. And, I mean, also the people that are doing that, I mean, are they, have they built companies themselves? Are they entrepreneurs? Do they know what they're doing? Um, or um, is it people that think, oh, wow, this is a really interesting asset class, and there's so much money flying around, and with people get, not getting money at the bank, what can you do? Oh, classic cars and venture capital. Great. Let's do venture capital. I mean, that's, I mean, that's the thinking behind, you know, usually these two guys with the two management consultants with the deck, right? I mean, they look at it from sort of a, a global financial perspective as an interesting asset class. But, you know... Um, that, that might be actually true and, and useful for, for, for later stage funds. And um, I mean, it, it, there is a certain logic why so much money is being you know, put in the market right now. And I don't even think it's a, it's a bad thing, but I think it's, especially when you raise your, your, your first fund, I mean, I mean, it comes a little bit back to the discussion that we, that we just had now um, with, you know, in terms of the, the support system is, I mean, the question is in the end, do the people that you have supported um, say, yeah, this was really good, this was extremely helpful, we used them all the time, and they were kick-ass, they were like, you know, extremely helpful, or not. I mean, in the end, it's, it's a reputation business. The problem is, is that, like you, what you said earlier, the, the reputation, it, it doesn't, bad, bad actors don't get washed out as quickly as with entrepreneurs. I mean, you raise your seat, you fuck up, you're done, you know? <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, that's not the way it works with venture capital. But I think still reputation um, is, is, is the single biggest asset you have there and, and that, that sort of that word spreads fairly quickly, I think. Yeah, I'm um, just buying into your thesis that, you know, the best entrepreneurs don't want or need any kind of support and they just want to be left alone and have donut board <laughs> meetings. Um, wh why VC at all, you know, especially at early stages? Why not just raise from various types of crowdfunding, equity crowdfunding platforms, you know, get your product pre-financed, um, Kickstarter, you know, why, why bother with these dudes? It's a good question. And I think, at the end of the day, getting good investors, you know, um, there is a real benefit in it. So I don't know if it's the recruiting or, or the other stuff that some, you know, and we sell as well. Uh, but there is a real benefit, which is one is just credentialing, signaling. There's hundreds and thousands of startup, and the fact that you have a top-tier VC or a top-tier angel associated with your startup is going to help you raise the next round. It's going to help you hire, recruit, get better PR, get, a, get a more press. So it's kind of a self-fulfilling... Uh, kind of a thing when you, that, that makes the company better. So that's the one thing. And B, just having people that have done it before, that have seen companies before, that can help you and offer you advice and uh, help you kind of uh, avoid some of the pitfalls that you probably would avoid, uh, you probably would have had otherwise, is, is very helpful and it's very important, especially in the early stage when you don't have enough capital to kind of uh, try things and you know fail and then maybe try something else. You have to be successful very quickly in order to be able to raise that A round or from the A to the B round. What I would add to that, I think obviously the, these new crowdfunding platforms can be a great way for entrepreneurs to raise money if you have done that with the right people. But I think the challenge is then when you want to go to the next uh, fundraising round, who is gonna do the follow on, right? And I think now as there's a big trend where companies now want to stay private longer Right? They can grow so fast now that they can afford, there's new capital coming in, they can raise money in later rounds without going to IPO markets. Right? So you need to think about, this is changing the way the, the venture capital chain is, is, is happening. Right? So 
Now you're starting to see an emergence of larger funds that come in early in Series A, and then it will accompany the company all the way to the exit and are able to do small checks, but all the way to write you know, 50 or 100 million checks down the road. That is important for an entrepreneur, depending on your ambitions, if you want to go global, it's important to think who will be your partner as you raise more and more money. You cannot be afford to get stuck today if you have global ambitions with just a small, a small fundraise. You can be outbeaten by somebody who's going to raise a much bigger round than you in the US, right? So I think, think about who will be helping you along the way is also very important. But that being said, I mean, there's been this statistic flying around recently in this one article, the, the, the follow-on follow um, uh, quota of investment by, by, by large name firms, and it was between 50 and 90%. The best was 90, um, and, and you know, I think the average, or you know, I don't know, lower end was 50%. That means when you raise early from a, from a high profile um, uh, VC, where you're still you know, f actually finding product market fit and where you're in, this, in the stages of, of just understanding what your product is and very early on seed and pre-seed, um, it can actually be a problem when they, don't, you know, when they don't, don't come in for the A round. It also puts a lot of, a lot of uh, spotlight on you. And there is some examples here in Berlin, before Berlin was on the radar of all the big name VCs, where people actually built their company in peace and quiet with local money, with non-prolific VCs. Um, but they were able to get really, really far. And then in the B round, they brought in the big names from the US. Um, I mean, that is at least something, uh, some, something, to, um, something to consider. That it's, you know, the, the fact is that m only 50, between 50 and 90%, actually do all these follow-on rounds, right? And it doesn't necessarily mean that the company completely failed. I mean, there, there, there could be other reasons, right? Yeah, maybe just talking about uh, later stage rounds and you guys. So I'm an uh, <coughs> entrepreneur raising a Series B or Series C, um, and I'm, I'm really lucky. I've got interest from Bessemer and Atomico and Adreesen Horowitz, and everybody has their PR guy, their HR guy, and whatever. Is, it, is the market shaping up that the only differentiator is price? At later stages, is that it? Like, so it just boils down essentially to price. Is that what's happening? I know you're going to say no, but <laughs> well, the, the answer is no. Price matters. That's you know, that's one. It's impossible. You know, we can probably get a discount over someone who's second tier VC or someone who's not that attractive. Uh, but you know, in the end of the day, price matters. You can't just offer other stuff. So price is always going to be a meaningful uh, lever. But there's many other things. And the biggest one in the end of the day is kind of the relationship that you build with the entrepreneur over time and the entrepreneur builds, uh, builds with you. Because at that point, they many times realize that, you, you know, it, it's like marriage in the end of the day. You, you're getting, you know, into bed with this investor. Investor is getting into bed with you. There's almost no nice breakups between uh, investors and, and entrepreneurs. And if you don't feel comfortable with the entrepreneur, he doesn't feel comfortable with you. And by the time of the Series B, many times you already kind of know them. They know you. You met them. You know, most cases uh, you've helped them before. You've seen them progress. So there's kind of this trust element that makes it easier. And at that point, you were competing with, you know, probably not the only one who has the trust, but it's not a hundred different uh, uh, VC firms or investors. It's two or three. And that's uh, kind of the, where the price starts playing. I mean, I would encourage the entrepreneurs to do their diligence, right, as much as we do with you. Talk to previous founders of our portfolio companies, understand how we were helpful. That is a super important thing that you should all do before you take money from anybody. And you'll hear the stories are quite different, right, even if you have the same marketing message. Yeah, I, I agree with that. It's done way too little, especially in, in Europe. Um, so <clears throat> we said that lots of VC firms are dying. How do I, how do I recognize as an entrepreneur a, a, a dying swan? You don't have to name any names, by the way. Well, I mean, there, there is, uh, there, there's a couple of good books, and I mean, I didn't know a shit about venture capital before, before I became a VC. Um, so, I mean, there, there is things you can read, and, and, and don't, I, I mean, just ask, I mean, just really ask, like, you know, when did you, did your last investment, how, you know, how old's your fund? Um, I mean, it's not really hard to understand the structure of a VC, and from, you know, asking the right questions, it's also not very hard to understand where, um, where where they stand, you know. I mean, ask around. Did they have uh, problems, uh, you know, raising raising the the last fund? When was you know when was uh, maybe the the one the one partner you know in the golden age that did all the deals? Is he still there? I mean, you know, this is not so uh, hard to um, uh, to do your due diligence. But unfortunately, most uh, entrepreneurs they actually treat 
that we see like a black box, right? Oh, this is the guy with the money. We don't care where it comes from. Almost like a bank, right? Um, but we've all learned that also banks are not just a black box. So, I mean, it, it, it does make sense to actually understand what's, what's going on there. Um, also, you know, ask questions like how much, how much uh, follow-on capital are you actually, actually reserving for me? I mean, they might not actually have the answer, but sometimes they do. Sometimes there's a specific sum that they think like, okay, this is what we're going to have to keep um, dry in order to support this company further down the road. Because we actually think their predictions um, um, are, are, are wrong. Um, we think they're, they're going to need, need a lot more money. And it's interesting to sort of get these things out of the VC and sort of, you know, try to get to his uh, uh, internal thinking. Um, and usually also when an entrepreneur asks you these kind of questions, you know you have, you're dealing with an experienced entrepreneur. So it's not that you know, it's something like, oh, I shouldn't ask these questions because then maybe you know, he gets pissed off and it's maybe not my business. It is your business. And when you ask these questions, I think your chance of getting uh, finance are actually um, higher um, when you know, they understand that you actually know what you're doing. I think one of the things that entrepreneurs don't do often enough is kind of check with the VC what other investments they've made in that space. Because in the end of the day, investors typically invest kind of in lines. They do one investment in a space, then they continue doing similar ones in, in the space because they get more comfortable, they know about it more. And the chances, if you know, if I've never done a FinTech investment, chances that my first FinTech investment is going to be you are much lower. You're, you're better off you know, spending your time with investors that kind of do FinTech, if you're in the FinTech sector, uh, than just you know, someone who doesn't do it. Um, so you're based in a beautiful Lisboa, uh, but you guys also have a, an office in London. We're here in Berlin. Um, a lot of people are now raising funds saying, hey, you know, it's all about Berlin and we're going to be local and early or about all these other ecosystems in Europe. I always make myself really unpopular by saying that I think being local is massively overrated in our world. And if I look at how you raised some of your seed rounds as an entrepreneur, and if I look at some of our seed rounds as people from the Bay Area, from the East Coast, entrepreneurs can now raise money from anywhere. Is like being local as a VC, does that even matter? Is it really an advantage or is it just another marketing gag? I think it depends a lot on the stage of the company. I think uh, the earlier you are, the closer you'll probably want to spend time with your VCs and there are going to be a lot more interactions. And so I think it's important to be able to pick up the phone, to meet face to face, to do a lot of, as you have a lot of questions, in the, especially in the earlier stage, if you're relying on somebody who's going to be, especially in a huge fund with a lot of portfolio companies and is going to maybe only fly every three months and you, that's probably going to be a, a big challenge for you. So location does matter. If you're a much more mature company, and you're comfortable with having board meetings every, you know, every three months, and you have a very mature team, and you, less, you need less guidance, then obviously the dynamic changes. So I think, I think that's probably the most important thing to look at as you're making that decision. I agree. I mean, um, half of our, or a third of our portfolio companies actually sit in our building. Uh, not because we make them to, but because they, they, they want to, and because there is you know, a certain community between them as well. Um, but, which doesn't mean that they can't or haven't raised um, money from other places at the same time, but um, the, the the main point of contact, uh, you know, being us and really working with them actively, um, it makes a difference um, where they are. Um, but you know, I mean, of course, these things in, within Europe can easily be overcome. People can you know come work somewhere else for a week and you know do a workshop and these kind of things. But um, I think. From a company perspective, if it's a VC you really want to work with and it's really hands-on, makes sense that they're that they're close by. The other way around, when you look at from the VC perspective, you know where do you get your 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 deals from? Of course, it's I think these days it's not enough to just you know, sit sit in one ecosystem and 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 wait for the for the best things to be shown to you. I mean, um, there are certain hubs in Europe where then companies, once they become a company, once they become a little bigger, gravitate to. But these days, of course, you find very interesting and cool stuff everywhere. And, you know, in the, in every, any village in Romania could be the next really, really cool company. So, I mean, um, to have that sort of bias that, you know, the good companies are only going to come out of the big hubs, that's, that's, that's crap. On the contrary, because sometimes you more, have more peace and quiet when, you don't, when you're not in London or Berlin. Yeah, I, know, I, don't, I have no idea how much time we have. Do we have another minute? Is that true? Four minutes, okay. Is this interactive with questions? Should I, should, yeah, does anybody have any questions? Otherwise, we'll keep on yapping. There's one right there. Oh. Um, 
What is your personal opinion about corporate venture capital and somehow what is the biggest disadvantage or the biggest challenge for entrepreneurs when they work together with a corporate venture capitalist? So, I just uh, I had a blog about this, so uh, it's an easy one for me. I think people overrate the corporate uh, venture capital firms. I think for early stage uh, companies, it could be even very risky to take money from corporate uh, VCs. Because one, when you have a regular VC you know, firm, when they go in, the incentive structure is completely aligned. No, everybody wants the company to have a bigger exit. You benefit, they benefit. When you're a corporate and you're inside a company, there's, you know, on the one hand, you might acquire the company, so you don't want them to be you know, too successful. On the other hand, you're, you're in it. So it's, it's a weird dynamic. Uh, and B, when you're associated with a corporate, you know, if you're working with EMC or Cisco or whoever it's going to be, you're going to be very quickly kind of branded as, you know, you're the EMC company. And then NetApp is not going to work with you or any competitor is not going to work with you. And C, the other thing that you have to realize is these corporate VCs, when they come in, because they're less, you know, they don't, you know, it doesn't matter whether they're going to do $10 million or $20 million uh, revenue by selling you. What they care is mainly the option to buy you. So they always negotiate a ROFIN, a right of first negotiation, basically, or some kind of ROFER, which allows them to get some terms. Either you have to tell them when you're, you're getting acquired. Sometimes it's really draconian. Some of these uh, uh, corporate VC firms, they negotiate that you have to tell them who's uh, offered, how much they offered. And basically, everybody knows that, you know, at that point, there's no bidding war anymore. So you're kind of doomed. Uh, so I think there is benefit in uh, corporate VCs, but it's typically in later stages. And you want to bring them together, like a few of them, a few competing ones, so it's not, you're not associated with one of them. And at later stages, you typically t have more leverage as well in these negotiations versus an early stage. So typically, I, adva I advise entrepreneurs to separate the investments from kind of a business deal. You want to do the business deal, investments later. Okay, yeah, I think unfortunately we have to stop, uh, but we'll be hanging around and maybe we can do Q&A afterwards. Thank you. Thank you.